Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some new research in regards to objects known as rogue planets, sometimes also known as planemos, or free-floating planets, objects that in real life might resemble something like this. And basically these are planets that used to exist around various star systems, but have since been kicked out for one reason or another. But most likely because of the interaction with other, more massive planets, for example planets like Jupiter or other gas giants. And in modern science there's actually a prediction for a planet that used to exist in the solar system that was probably kicked out by Jupiter approximately 4.4 billion years ago. And that planet, if it's somewhere out there, is probably some kind of a gas giant as well and is probably just floating around like the object you see right here. One of the propositions suggests that these unusual planets don't just contain a lot of primordial organic material potentially perfect for early life, but might also contain moons similar to a typical gas giant like Jupiter and Saturn, and it's these moons that have a very high chance of maybe even maintaining excellent conditions for life to survive. With the second suggestion being a little bit more hypothetical. These types of planets and these types of moons might also provide an excellent way for various hypothetical extraterrestrial civilizations to hitch a ride and to travel across the entire galaxy pretty much for free in conditions that would be somewhat hospitable. And so let's discuss some of this new research in regards to rogue planets and talk a little bit more about what it actually means for us and talk a little bit more about some of the conclusions from all of these studies. But I guess first, what do we know about rogue planets as an actual astronomical object as opposed to just being a hypothesis? Well, today there is quite a lot of proof that they do exist out there and there are quite a lot of them, but they're just very difficult to see. They're normally referred to as free-floating planets, mostly because they don't actually have any star to be attached to, and they all seem to have been produced in the same way, kicked out from various star systems because of their gravitational interaction with something else. And for the most part, they all have been discovered by using infrared observations, such as from the previously operational WISE telescope, which also means that the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be able to find more of them in the next few years. For example, back in 2021, just over a hundred of these objects has been officially identified in at least one region of the night skies, and so several hundred have already been proposed. You can find some of the candidates in the list in the description below. But for the most part these are really massive objects, very often several times the mass of Jupiter, because that's essentially the only way we can see them. They do produce just a little bit of infrared light. Although some less massive objects have also been discovered by using what's known as gravitational lensing. But in the last few years the scientists studying these objects wanted to figure out several things about them in regards to how potentially hospitable these can be to essentially liquid water and maybe even organic life. Can something survive around these planets, or at least around the moons orbiting them? And so one of the first papers on the subject investigated the idea of even having moons around these planets. If some kind of a gas giant like Jupiter kicks out these planets, would they still maintain their moons? And turns out that the answer is yes. Even if these objects leave the star system, including the solar system, the moons stay orbiting around them with maybe just a little bit of a deviation compared to the original orbit. And based on what we know from objects like Jupiter and Saturn, because of the orbital interactions, some moons can start to assume various properties, including a lot of heat. And so for example Jupiter's moon Io is the most volcanic moon in the solar system because of powerful tidal interactions between other moons and Jupiter itself. And if the orbit of the moon is not perfectly circular or just a little bit eccentric, it's going to experience even more tidal interactions and thus have a lot more heat coming from the inside. And that's kind of what's happening with Io. In theory, if this moon was slightly bigger and was able to maintain an atmosphere, it could technically be much warmer, potentially even host liquid water. Something similar happens around Saturn's Enceladus and technically also happens around other Jupiter's moons including Europa that seems to possess a lot of tectonic activity because of all of these gravitational interactions. And so assuming that one of these moons is also atmospheric or contains thick enough atmosphere, all of this internal heat can then start to accumulate in the atmosphere and thus result in somewhat prominent warm conditions on the entire surface of the object. Although you do need to have a somewhat thick heat trapping atmosphere, most likely dominated by carbon dioxide. And in theory, this could actually lead to these super dark objects, practically no light here, yet still warm enough for actual liquid ocean on the surface. And even potentially have a lot of other habitable conditions needed for life to sustain itself for a very long time. 
At least that was the proposition initially, and so the scientists behind this recent study wanted to do a bit more number crunching and a lot more mathematical analysis to see if it's actually possible. And after 8000 computer simulations, first of all they confirmed that indeed these planets maintain their moons, and second of all they confirmed that tidal effects would be able to last long enough to warm up these objects for hundreds of millions of years. In theory, even allowing some primitive life to evolve on these planets and to then create some kind of a primitive biosphere. And for moons whose atmospheric pressure would be similar to Earth, they could have these conditions for approximately 50 million years. But if the atmospheric pressure increases up to about 10 times of planet Earth, which has been predicted in other studies, the planet can suddenly maintain these conditions for 300 million years. Or even 1.6 billion years if the pressure is similar to Venus. And the thing about these objects is that because there's no star here, nothing can potentially strip the atmosphere from any of these planets or any of these moons. And so in theory, the pressure keeps accumulating, thus allowing these temperatures to exist for a very long time, and maybe even maintaining habitability for billions of years. But the way this energy is generated, which is tidal effects, because of the orbital imperfections, is not permanent. Over time, the orbits would very likely circularize, and thus the overall heating production would decrease in time, which of course means that after billions of years, these moons would very likely reduce the overall temperature, and the water would probably freeze. But modern calculations suggest that there's actually a lot of these free-floating planets, possibly even more than actual stars, and so the chance for at least some of them to have these conditions technically is super high. With the study suggesting that simulations so far do imply these objects exist and some of them do have habitable conditions. Whether life can actually evolve there is a different question, we're not going to know for a very long time. But something else interesting has been proposed by another study. Something in regards to these objects, how many of them there are, hypothetically, out there, and the fact that some of them do have these habitable conditions. In theory, some of these unusual objects can potentially serve as free real estate, for any civilization that wants to escape their own star. And that's of course assuming that there's some kind of an advanced civilization out there that one day realizes that there's really no way to travel faster than light. And so they realize that the only way to travel anywhere is to maybe hitch a ride. And just like us today, they realize that there seems to be a way to hitch a ride on a lot of planetary objects that have been kicked out from other stars that travel across the universe. Which of course means that the only spaceship you really have to create to even travel anywhere would be the spaceship able to reach these objects. And after that, the goal is to somehow survive on the surface of these objects, waiting for them to travel across the galaxy, reaching some other distant object that might be of interest to your particular civilization. And when it comes to galactic exploration, at the moment this actually makes the most sense. You have these objects that have a lot of resources on them, you have moons with a lot of resources, and maybe even conditions necessary for your life to survive. And most importantly, there's also probably some protection from external sources. Things like magnetosphere or basic atmosphere. And so instead of developing some kind of a generation ship, a lot of advanced civilizations, in theory, could just use these rogue planets to travel across the entire galaxy for millions of years. And even this idea of generation ship today is not particularly feasible. The amount of potential failures on a large ship like this is way too high for an actual mission to survive. Yet by being on a rogue planet that's traveling across the galaxy, the chance for your survival is much much higher. And since it's quite possible that a lot of these planets might even contain conditions not so different from the planet where this civilization evolved, at the moment this is not a very far-fetched idea. For example, based on various observations, we know that approximately every 50,000 years, at least one star passes pretty close to the solar system, within approximately one light year away, or within the Oort cloud. And statistically, this also means that quite a few of these rogue planets very likely move through this region as well, just as frequently, if not more. And so by detecting this object in advance, and by planning the mission way in advance as well, it's not impossible for some kind of a civilization to transfer just enough materials to survive here, and to then, and to then just maybe hibernate or even survive by adapting to new, very dark conditions. And because these objects provide quite a lot of resources, quite a lot of protection, and lots of space to live on, and also because they generally travel in a single direction, eventually encountering another star somewhere out there, it provides everything needed for survival. But you have to be able to survive on these objects for possibly millions of years. Because it's probably going to take millions of years before this planet reaches another star system that's good enough for this particular civilization to transfer to. And assuming a civilization that's advanced enough, for all we know, they could also maybe find a way 
to turn this planet into an actual ship. Maybe even developing a way to steer it around and to nudge it in certain directions. Or the alternative way, a more advanced civilization could even pick a planet from their own star system and turn it into a rogue planet of its own. And they might want to do so if their star system is failing. And even here on Earth, some scientists propose that one day, if we become advanced enough, we could maybe use an object like Sedna that you see right here by turning it into some kind of an escape ship billions of years in the future when the sun becomes a little bit too hot. Sedna was chosen mostly because it's really far away from the sun and thus is much easier to separate from the entire solar system. Although technically, in the next 6 to 7 billion years, when the sun starts to lose a lot of its mass, at some point Sedna might actually even separate from the solar system by itself and thus become its own rogue object. So it is one of those objects that maybe one day, if there is anyone in the solar system, could be used as a kind of a transfer ship. And by doing this several times across different planets, it then becomes possible for the civilization to spread across larger parts of the galaxy and do so many times in the future as well. But this is of course very hypothetical. Can we even prove this? Or can we ever detect these objects? Or can we ever detect any of this happening? Well, like I said before, despite them being very dark, they still produce just a little bit of infrared radiation. And so if one day the scientists discover unusual infrared emissions that should not be there, coming from a distant rogue planet, or basically excess amount of infrared emissions, it might suggest something unusual happening here, including a potential techno signature. On the other hand, radio emissions from various artifacts located on this planet would also be a telltale sign. But at the moment, even the James Webb Space Telescope might actually have trouble detecting all of this, and especially detecting anomalies. It is nevertheless an exciting proposition, especially because of various recent discoveries, such as a planet discovered in 2020, that seems to be a rogue planet with the mass of planet Earth. Which of course implies that many of these objects do have a very high chance of having somewhat habitable conditions, and even having complex organic chemistry on the surface, despite being completely dark and lacking any starlight which have even been suggested as a kind of a blessing. The lack of ultraviolet radiation will technically protect the very complex atmospheres around these unusual objects. Or at least that's what the scientists believe based on a lot of computer simulations and a lot of mathematical analysis. We don't actually have any physical proof just yet, other than detections of these objects from various surveys. And I mean, for all we know, these are super dark, super cold and very inhospitable objects that have nothing on their surface. And even their moons could be extremely inhospitable as well. But because there are billions of these in existence in the Milky Way alone, the chance for at least one to be somewhat interesting and maybe even somewhat hospitable is of course still there. Although we're not going to know more until future observations, until future searches using infrared frequencies, and until more exciting discoveries using various surveys. And until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person issue that you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.